Richard grew up in England, uh, and uh, he was born uh, and grew up uh, prior to and during World War II. In fact, he told stories about how uh, the Luftwaffe bombed his little town that he was from, and he was on the, on the bus. And the German planes came in and bombed the main street of town, and the bus crashed, and he got out and went into the bank where his father worked at the bank. And, uh, you know, everybody, the glass was broken all over the place, and, and he had some cuts on him, but he was generally okay. Uh, but he told stories about being in World War II and uh, serving in the, the Royal Air Force. He told me the story of being in World War II, and he was a, an RAF pilot. And he said that he literally flew into this English village and saw this handsome guy, and they checked into a, a village inn together and just made passionate love for two days. And the maids would come in and change the linen and the, and the towels and thought nothing of two blokes sitting up shirtless in bed going, yeah, would you leave those towels there? We're going to get up in a bit. And then when they'd leave, they would have at each other, and no one knew. His real love always was... Uh, the stage. He always loved acting, um, and so he, he went to London to pursue it. And within uh, very short order, which will become a, a pattern in his life, he goes from arriving new in town and nobody knows him to starring in major productions in the West End, not an insignificant place. This is not summer stock in Des Moines. This is the West End of London, and he's rubbing elbows with John Gilgood and Laurence Olivier. He did tell me that when he was very young, and it was just beginning out, he'd just gotten out of dramatic, drama school, and he was uh, a quite handsome young man, and he went to a, a party, and uh, Gilgood was there, John Gilgood, and Laurence Olivier were both there. And they were both kind of fawning over him a bit, uh, and uh, he, they both asked him to go home with him. And he said, he said, well, I chose John. He said, I think I made a mistake. <laughs> and so after being on the West End for six to 12 months, he decides he's going to go to Broadway. Gets on a boat and goes to New York. Doesn't know anybody. He has a name that Laurence Olivier gave him. Said, when you go to New York, go and see this person. So he goes, sees the person. Within six months, he's starring on Broadway. And so after about six or 12 months of being in Broadway, he says, OK, I'm going to go to Hollywood. And he moves to Hollywood, immediately signs a contract with MGM. And his first film is The Three Musketeers. And his dressing room was between Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire. Welcome to Hollywood. That's the period where, you know, the Hollywood studio, it was a studio system. And they'd always be on the lookout for, you know, those tall, lean, handsome men with piercing eyes. And they took Richard, you know, like a year's contract, a two-year contract, that sort of thing. Sent him off in a lovely big ship, very, very nice. And then, you know, they, somebody said they just didn't know what to do with him. Like, he was always in films with more handsome, already leading actors. So he was always the second or third and, you know, didn't make enough impression. I definitely didn't know that Richard had relationships with men until you'd mentioned it. He always told me stories that involved ladies. And to be honest, a lot of the times he was kind of flirtatious. And, you know, flirtatious, like when my mom came to town or if I had a girlfriend stop by, he'd be always the charmer. I was definitely trying to win them over. Maybe that's just it, is that he loved being the leading man. And, you know, the way Hollywood does compartmentalize and wants to think of an, an only straight man as a leading man. And I'm sure that's been instilled with him, in him for a long time. And, you know, he was always this, like, daredevil and did adventurous things and did the adventure of the motorbike racing at super fast speeds. Clearly could have almost killed himself many times. And that doesn't compute in his head, I don't think. 
he had two careers. He was Richard Stapley through the 50s. Then as the 60s came up and he was you really in his, uh, his libido was going off the charts and he was making money and he eyed Europe as a lot of British. He eyed Italy and he said, you know what? I'm now going to be Richard, Richard Weiler. Richard Weiler became a cowboy star on the level of Lee Van Cleef, the Clint Eastwood, on a much lower level, but he was making those spaghetti westerns. When I started a motorcycle messenger business, so we call it courier business in the UK, uh, in 1975, uh, and in Covent Garden in London, and it was a um, fairly fledgling sort of business then. There weren't many motorcycle courier companies around, and um, we, you know, the business started taking off because uh, more and more stuff was urgent to be taken around London. And we used to advertise for motorcycle messengers in the motorcycle press. And one day, uh, Richard sort of walked in the door and um, we were very impressed with him. Um, he, I think he was about 54 at the time. And uh, uh, we couldn't believe, you know, that he was this Hollywood, ex-Hollywood actor, if you like. He had a keen interest in motorcycles. Um, and he'd fallen on hard times, I think, and needed the money, the extra cash. Um, and before we knew it, he was riding for us. And before we knew it, we had a little um, thing on the local news ab ab about him. Um, of course, he was quite well known still then. Um, he'd done The Man from Interpol uh, and, and other stuff. and. Um, you know, perhaps the sort of slightly older generation knew about him, but he was still still well known. People would recognise him. You know, uh, you sort of you could go around and the doorman at hotels would recognise him, and uh, he'd occasionally bump into people he knew. Um, so I, don't, I don't know whether he he was happy about that or not. Or not. Richard wrote an article. I can't remember what magazine. Maybe it was Bike Magazine about Security Dispatch. And he's responsible for many of us joining Security Dispatch, the motorcycle messenger company in London, because we read that article. We're like, wow, it looks great. What fun. Get paid to ride a bike all day long, right? It was an English soap company called Imperial Leather. And there was this kind of ghastly soap. They'll probably still sell it. But in the middle of the soap, there was this little kind of golden gold leaf thing, which would shrink down, shrink, 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 until all you had left of the soap was this tiny little thing. And the gold kind of plate would stay there forever and the soap would shrink down. And they kind of market it as an upper class kind of soap. So Richard did the commercial for Imperial Leather forever. And it ran and ran and ran. So I think in a way that excited us and where we, oh, that's the guy from the Imperial Leather adverts. That's how we first recognized him. Because those, I don't know if you've seen the guy on the plane and he's once around the block, you know, and the plane circles around. He's got the Imperial Leather, he's in the... He's in the bathtub in the jet, the private jet. That's how most people knew Richard. But I also remembered him from another TV series which ran in England in the 50s or 60s called The Man from Interpol. And I mentioned it to my mom. And I'm like, I think I'm working with this guy who used to be The Man from Interpol. She's like, I remember that. You know, it's just like, and he's working as a motorcycle messenger in the same room and we're drinking coffee together. It's very strange. He's like a ghost of Christmas future given to the messengers and just this is what I could become if I don't behave myself or if I become a famous actor and don't invest my money. Sorry, Richard. That could happen to me, but I think it, it kind of crossed everyone's minds in a way because most people doing motorcycle messengering in London in the 80s were in the early 20s. You know, there was a few kind of people, older we call them fossil, you know, fossils. or But, but Richard was definitely from another planet. I mean, another another era. I think Richard got along really pretty well with most of the guys in the company. Um, he, was, he was kind of an anachronism, kind of a pet in a way. I think they respected his riding ability because Richard always wore these really expensive Italian leathers, you know. And we had these kind of nasty rubber rain suits on things. You know, quality gear, but not everyone rode in, in full racing leathers, but Richard did. He'd had a book published that he had co-written, although he told me that he had written it. He had actually written, but it had someone else's name on it as well. Um, and it was being sold on Amazon 
and I, I think I may have been the one of the few people that actually bought it on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't get to keep it long because he said, could he borrow it? And I never saw it again. <laughs> so, but that was the way Richard was. He was a charmer. So he would charm a hotel into letting him stay there. Maybe he would get a deal because it's kind of dead. And he'd point out, maybe it's quiet. You should give me a deal. I'll stay here for a whole month. Places where he needed to get new headshots done or some kind of photographic work. He would find ways to charm them into giving things to him for free, and he'd sign a few pictures over. He, you know, sometimes he would do things like, Barbara, I want to take you out for ice cream. And then we'd get to the ice cream parlor, and he'd go, oh, I don't have any money. <laughs> well, and sometimes I was confused, because i say, why don't you audition again, Richard? I mean, there's lots of roles for older gentlemen. And he'd say, oh, no, I, I don't think anyone would hire me. But then he'd go and get headshots done. So I wasn't sure what that was about. I don't know if it was a fear that he hadn't done it for a while, or maybe he didn't want to find out that no one wanted him. It didn't make sense. I had this cat who had been abused by a man and was terrified of men, but for some reason loved Richard. And she loved his voice. She would just try to capture every word and absolutely let him touch her when other men weren't allowed to touch her and, um, and she would go outside and they'd have their little moments outside etc and he just loved her he had such a great fondness for her and they had happy moments together and then she was killed by someone just before Halloween I guess in some sort of ritual and the neighborhood was upset but Richard was really upset about it because it ended up it made the news Richard knew how much I loved that cat. And he did too. So he shows up one day and he gives, he's really humble. And he gives me this letter and he goes, I want you to read this. And he basically put himself into a writing form. He became my cat. Dearest Barbara, all I could think was I'd never see you again. That was the pain I suffered. The only pain, you know me, the Duchess, which is what he always called her because she really had an attitude. I was only worried for my beautiful coat. I wanted to be there to greet you home and I was there, but I knew you couldn't see me. Perhaps I knew it would happen. So I left two whiskers for you and your mom, but my heart is yours. They can cut away this and that, but no one but you can steal another's heart especially the soul. I will be close to you when you fly, in the middle of the night, when you open your eyes to awaken. You will carry me here and there in a handbag. A handbag? Because I did put her in a handbag sometimes. If I could only write or learn to use a pen or maybe find someone to show me, I would tell you, beloved Barbara, don't grieve. I listen to your laughter, I see you smile, I feel the love, and I'll, I will be back, and I will be close forever. Kisses, 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 your Duchess, your Sammy. And a cute little drawing of, I think that's supposed to be a cat with a halo. Richard Stapley is known to me almost exclusively because he appeared in an early I mean, 1951, 52, early universal horror movie called The Strange Door. Now, this movie was made right at the absolute last death rattle of Universal Pictures' horror legacy. They were one inch into Creature from the Black Lagoon Land. They were one inch into the atomic bomb. The Strange Door starred Charles Lawton and Boris Karloff and Sally Forrest. Richard was the young, handsome, virile leading man. I didn't know who he was because he was calling himself Richard Weiler. But then he happened to say, uh, Isabel said something about me loving Karloff. And he said, oh, I made a picture with him. I said, well, back up a minute. What did you, I know his career inside now. And he said, well, I did The Strange Door. I was Richard Stapley then. I went, you're Richard Stapley? And so I conned him into coming over to my apartment. And we sat down and I had the laser disc of The Strange Door. 
And we put it on, and I had the microphone, and I taped Richard watching himself. And this was very telling, because I'd have to turn the tape recorder off and say, Richard, you have to talk. He was looking at these, oh, I was so handsome. I would have done me. I said, yeah, I guess you would have. I would have done me. But he could not, for the life of himself, remember things that most people do when you do an audio commentary, like what Lawton was like. He remembered bits and pieces of Car. He said Karloff sat in his limousine and would take his lunch and tea. He wouldn't even go in the dressing room. He's like, it was like a getaway car. And that he and Lawton were friendly, but they had had some. And I said, let's, come on, give me more, give me more. I literally, because you know me, I said, well, did Charles Lawton come on to you? And he said, well, of course he did. But we're professional. He, it was a look. Would you like to come up to the house? And he said, if I had said yes, then shame on me if I'm not interested. And I, I applaud that in Richard. You know, he didn't, you know, he didn't uh, play games, at least not with men. When I knew him, his looks were gone. But he had charm, and he had great stories. But he was bitter, and he was always going to Kinko's to, to get a script, and he would get angry with people. And there was some fellow in the UK that was paying for his apartment in Barham, on Barham Boulevard. And there was a day, I remember, where the money didn't come in and they were gonna chuck him out. And that's when I suggested that we do uh, these autograph shows. So I said, I got a friend of mine to do a banner for the strange door. I just pushed the strange door to death. And Richard Stapley here, you know, also Richard Weiler. It was like there were two of them. It was like Patty Duke time, you know, identical cousins. And uh, I got Richard all wired up about it. So we go, and it's over here at the hotel uh, near the airport. And it's raining. And we set up the table. And he says, I'm just going to say this to you. I have one shirt, the shirt I'm wearing. Everything else needs to be dry cleaned. I have to at, at least make $50 to get my dry cleaning. Mickey Rooney was directly opposite us in a state of dementia with his awful wife, Pat, trying to get him to comb his hair. And he says, don't touch me. Leave my hair alone. And he just, he just drug him out of a nursing home to bring him there. Lana Wood, you know, wanting to call the authorities to have R.J. Wagner arrested. Uh, way over here, you know, is somebody like uh, Robert Quarry from Count Yorga, who just had seen it all and didn't care. I thought, because the horror genre, everyone in it is so loyal, I bargained for the fact that he had been in the presence of Lawton and Karloff to get us through. But I will tell you this. We made exactly $40, which I, I didn't keep a penny. I gave it to him to get out his shirts. I hate to say it. I mean, I used to dread him knocking on my door because he was always needing something or wanting me to go somewhere. And of course, I had the car. And I would be driving him places. And it reached a point where I just felt like I was being used. And we all did. I often wonder, is it better to have lived an entire life and never had money, never been famous, never had any of the perks in life that come with that kind of lifestyle, or to have had it and lost it? Because sometimes the loss is so overwhelming that it, it, you just can't enjoy the here and now. He wanted to have this moment in life. He mentioned it several times. He couldn't wait to put a tux back on, look very smart, and open bottles of expensive champagne. I had not heard from Richard for a few days, which was very unlike him. Typically, I would hear from him at least daily, sometimes multiple times a day. And I had not heard from him for a few days. And, uh, and I had called the hotel, and they said, oh, no, he's gone, and didn't know where he had gone. And they said, no, he's gone. And I said, well, where'd he go? We don't know. He's gone. And they were clearly very glad to be rid of him and wanted no more conversation about Richard Stapley because they hung up the phone, and that was the last anyone would ever talk to me about him. So I really did not know anything until a couple weeks later when I got a call from his attorney saying, Richard has passed away. 
I don't know what happened to Richard's body. I don't know what happened to Richard's papers. I don't know what happened to Richard's typewriter, his clothes. I don't know what any of I have a suspicion that all of the things that were in the hotel room, the motel room, uh, the management just threw them out. He went to the hospital and they said he's gone and they threw him out. And that's the end of that. So all of the things that Richard was writing, gone. I have no idea what he wrote. He could have written the greatest novel ever written and it's gone. I think Richard would be thrilled that Richard's name was being spoken again. Uh, he was, uh, at his core, Richard saw himself as a star. Whether he was or not, he saw himself as a star. Uh, for a good chunk of his life, he was a star. He very much was a star. And that never left him. Uh, he probably had it before he was a star. He certainly became a star, and it just never left. That was ingrained in him at the deepest level. So I think Richard would be, would be thrilled that this was happening. He'd also want to know where his cut of the, of the check was. 